Good afternoon, everyone. Can you believe it's now day three of the annual educational symposium of the American Parkinson's Disease Association for the Connecticut chapter? We've already heard two excellent presentations on this year's theme, technology and innovation in Parkinson disease management. For those of you who were not able to join us these last couple of days, my name's still Rachel Jeffreyan, and I'm still the APDA Connecticut Information and Referral Center Coordinator. The APDA offers a variety of services in the state of Connecticut, and we have a vast array of publications, webinars, articles, and videos that can help you learn more about Parkinson disease. You can find all of these at apdaparkinson.org slash CT, or by calling our Information and Referral Center at 860-734-6393. Now, how does the APDA raise the funding to offer all these fantastic resources to our PD community, you might ask? One of the highlights of our year has always been the APDA Optimism Walk, where members of our Parkinson community and generous sponsors get together at a local park to raise funds for and raise awareness about Parkinson disease. Lauren Arardi is the Vice President of the APDA Connecticut Board and the Director of Academic Technology at Quinnipiac University. Despite her busy schedule, Lauren has somehow still found the time to be the Optimism Walk Chairman for several years with resounding success. Would you like to take the virtual stage and tell our audience about this year's walk, Lauren? Sure, thanks, Rachel. And thank you to all of you for being here. As Rachel said, my name is Laura Narardi. My father was first diagnosed with Parkinson's 15 years ago, and I've been a member of the APDA Connecticut Chapter Board for a little over six years. And it is an honor talking to all of you. The Parkinson's community is one of undeniable strength and fortitude, and our optimism walks provide an opportunity for everybody to get together. There's power in numbers, and let me tell you, the energy, passion, and courage that our walk attendees bring, it's just amazing. And the feeling of community and providing an opportunity for family and friends to show their support are the primary focus of our Optimism Walks. They're also one of our most important fundraisers, and the money we raise from our walks is directly invested back into our community in the form of grants, educational opportunities like these, and so much more. I wish I could say save the date for our upcoming Optimism Walk, but like so many other things this year, we are in a bit of a holding pattern. In normal times, we try to host two walks a year, one in Southern Connecticut and another in the Northern part of the state. As of now, we are planning to hold our next walk in the fall, and it is our sincere hope we can have the walk in person in Southern Connecticut, though we'll be ready with plan B just in case it needs to be virtual again. Please keep an eye on our Facebook page and the APDA Connecticut chapter website for more information. Thank you very much for your time and I hope to see you at an upcoming walk. Thank you, Lauren. I'm sure you've inspired our audience, our audience to make sure to join us for this year's walk, whether it ends up being virtual or in person. And of course, we would also like to say thank you to the sponsors of this year's symposium and hope they will sponsor us even more generously when Lauren comes knocking on their door in the fall. Our gold level sponsors are Adamus and Neurocrin. Our silver level sponsors are Abvi, Acadia, Griswold Home Care, Medtronic, Synovian, and Supernus. And our bronze level sponsors are Brightview on New Canaan and Kiowa Kieran. Now, I hope you still remember the ground rules. Although you have all been muted to minimize unintentional distractions to the speaker from background noise, we absolutely do want to hear from you. So please feel free to type any questions you may have in the chat box or the Q&A throughout the presentation. Just click on the icons at the bottom banner on your screen and type in your question in the forum addressed to everyone. We will have a few minutes after the presentation to ask our speaker your questions. And to introduce today's presentation is Cynthia Streeter, representative of one of our silver sponsors, Synovian. Thank you so much, Rachel. Yes, I am Cynthia Streeter from Synovian, and it was a distinct honor to be a supporter and sponsor of the American Parkinson's Disease Association of Connecticut. While I am covering Connecticut and Rhode Island, we are always available to serve the Parkinson's community. It is my distinct honor today to introduce Rhonda Hickey. 
As a seasoned professional with more than 20 years of rehabilitation experience, Rhonda Hickey is known as the neurological occupational therapist for UConn Health, my own alma mater. She's involved with the Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis centers at the outpatient pavilion of UConn Health and is a LSVT BIG certified instructor. She has particular interest in finding new adaptive and innovative ways to assist people becoming more independent with home modifications and assistive technology. Thus, the topic of her talk, home modifications and adaptive equipment to improve quality of life in people with Parkinson disease. When not working, Rhonda enjoys sewing, gardening, listening to podcasts and traveling, particularly if she can be with her 16 year old son. Rhonda holds a master degree in occupational therapy and BSOS from American International College. Welcome, Rhonda. Oh, Rhonda, I think you just need to unmute. Good. All right. Good morning. I'm sorry, not good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending the third day of the virtual symposium of the Connecticut chapter of the American Parkinson's Disease Association. I'm Rhonda Hickey. I've been an occupational therapist for over 20 years. And in the past five years, I joined the Yukon Health team in developing their neuro rehabilitation outpatient program. I'm honored to present to you home modifications and adaptive equipment to improve the life of Parkinson's. Okay. Hold on, I'm just trying to get, um, there we go, good, <laughs> we got it. All right, what I'm hoping to over be able to uh, review in this presentation is about Parkinson's. Part is the Parkinson's disease symptoms and affecting daily tasks, the need for adaptive equipment, and home modifications to age in place safely. And the people with Parkinson's team, the adaptive equipment for writing, eating, cooking, dressing, bathing, mobility, car, and household tasks. Then we're gonna go over most common areas that are home, that people modify their homes, okay? And that's gonna be, in entrances, bathrooms, and kitchens. And then lastly, I'm gonna to touch a little bit on a funding because there's an abundance funding and it could be a, a presentation and seminar all in itself. Okay, so my goal here is to present devices in technology that will make it easier to live with the progression of the disease. By that increasing one's safety, security, and functional independence as the disease progresses. I was really surprised by this stat that I have in front of you. Approximately 1.2 million people in the United States are predicted to have Parkinson's by the year 2030, according to the results of this large scale study by the Parkinson's Foundation. I really found that it was very, um, very striking because now more than ever, there is more need for home modifications, adaptive equipment, as well as new innovations, research to help live as long as you can with Parkinson's. Rhonda, can I um, just let you know to share your screen so that we could see your presentation? Oh, I didn't realize it was there. 
I thought you guys had it. So I'm, I apologize. Just hover over where it says share screen and you can. Um, sorry about that. I thought it was already shared. I'm really sorry about that. It's okay. <laughs> can you see it now? We can see it. Do you want to put it into the slideshow format? And then. Yes, I will. I didn't realize that it was there. That's okay. We're all learning. I it? know. I'm sorry about that. Here I'm going along. I'm glad you told me now. <laughs> sorry. Yes, I wasn't sure if we were. Okay. Be yes. From the beginning. Is that better? There we go. We okay. So this is the my first slide. <laughs> then we'll go to the second slide. This is the overview. Okay, I just need to get something else out of my way here. Good. And get here, here we go. There we go. Okay, so this is the overview, as I just mentioned. Okay, this is my uh, goals that I want to achieve here. Then the next screen we have is about the stat of 1.2 million people, how it's really important for that innovation to become okay all right the next page all right so what we're going to talk about here is i say living in space rather than aging in space because we are living and what you want to know is about advantages of living in space it's independence proving health outcomes low cost social interactions familiar settings so they don't have to leave their home. But also the considerations you need to take is the physical and mental status of the patient, the level of assistance they require or needed, who will provide these services, how much will cost and who will actually pay for it, okay? So when we're talking about this, we're talking about a team approach. It does take a team, you know how they talk about a village for people? and um, children and stuff. And I think it really takes a team for Parkinson's, for everybody to be on the same page, know what's going on and stuff. So in the team we have, we have the patient, we have the family members. Then we have the medical team. We have the doctors, the physicians, the occupational therapists, physical therapists, and speech therapists. Then if you're gonna have modifications, you're gonna to have to work with some vendors, lawyers, contractors, and caseworkers. So let's look at here about Parkinson's disease, how it affects the daily functioning. In this illustration, it shows typical symptoms of Parkinson's. So you have the tremor starting in the hands, then you might have balance problems where some people are frequently falling. Then you're gonna have the stiffness in the body then you might have speech changes and changes in swallowing, patterns of slowness and movement and trouble writing, okay? But then there's also secondary symptoms not so easily seen, like the lack of smell, loss of smell, sorry, lack of facial expressions, low blood pressure, sleeping difficulties, bladder and bowel dysfunction, anxiety, depression, hallucinations and dementia. So let's take a look at how some of these common symptoms affect their activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. That's what I mean by when I say activities of daily living, that's ADLs, and instrumental activities of daily living is IADLs. So let's take your hand chores and handwrite and the small handwriting samples that I'm gonna show you soon. Uh, that's gonna affect the fine motor coordination for written communication, manipulating fasteners, switches, carrying objects, and doing household chores. Then you might have stop, stooped posture, which is over. Unsteady gait definitely affects the balance. They're slow moving, especially for transfer, so one task to the next. This might affect the walking, transferring, sleep positions, bathing, dressing, cooking, and also household chores. And if you have a slow voice, 
I'm sorry, soft in a low voice. And, and also you could have swallowing difficulties. Definitely will affect the communication, socialization, and also, and also, I'm sorry, eating. Before we go into the show and tell of my presentation, which is the bulk of the presentation, we need to be on the same page of what assistive technology is, home modifications, and I'm gonna to touch a little bit on universal design. So let's talk about assistive technology. Is any item or equipment or product acquired commercially, modified or custom that is used to increase, improve, and to maintain functional capacities of individuals with different with disabilities. They're usually a low cost and easily accessible. But you also talk about adaptive technology. It's a subsection of assistive technology and sometimes they're used interchangeably. Then we talk about home modifications. These are changes, alterations and adaptations to the living environment made to improve the safety, access, independence and participation in daily activities. There are small to large modifications, take more planning, more time, more money, and more effort. I will touch a little bit on universal design, but this could be a presentation all in itself. So universal design is the planning to build physical learning or working environments so they're, they're usable by a wide range of people, regardless of their age or their disability status. This is where you see a lot of this universal design in public buildings, usually has codes and specific measurements. Without further ado, let's get into some adaptive technology. Whoop. Okay, so this is the adaptive technology for handwriting. As you see here, there are weighted pens, there are large barrel pens and pencils, this helps a person to hold on to the writing, either pencil, pen, crayon, and now colored pencils are very popular. Then you have the wrist weight. It's actually a weight in a, fa in a very fashionable way. Um, they go from a pound to about almost a, a full pound. It helps dampen the tremors and lets you able to use your hand. I have several patients in my clinic that have ordered these off of Etsy, and they were probably about $40, $50, and it's helped them tremendously. Plus, it looks really fashionable. Okay, then you have raised paper, raised line paper. This helps a person, um, gives a, a feedback of when to stop and start as far as when they're writing. Also gives you a very visual um, cue on where you need to write. Then you have the hand grippers here. See the pencil and hand grippers? There's several different types on the market. And this is one of the very first things I do with my patients. I have them try this first. I put it on a pencil and then I have the before and after and I will show you in the next slide. They're very affordable and you can get a package of like eight at the dollar store. Then you have computer voice um, text, voice to text software like Dragon. At the same time, you have, there's all different kinds of balance gloves out on the market. They constantly balance a wearer's trembling hand in real time. Many on the market, many need more research. Um, but this one right down here is the gyro glove. I, mean, I heard the, um, one of the, uh, the first panelists talk about it, um, but it does need a little bit more. It needs a little bit more feedback and research. Okay, then you have a vibrating glove, um, vibrating pen right here. And why do you see a vibrating glove? Well, um, pen, because what it needs is the extra uh, pressure for you to control it. So it sends that signal to your body that you need to put more energy. We call it more like amplitude into the movement. And so what it does, it helps and it, it controls it. Okay. Now we're gonna go to the next slide. This is an example, example of my patient. Um, this is on the first day that I saw her. I evaluated her about three weeks ago. The first one was done with a pen, which you would normally write. 
Then I had her take a pencil with a gripper and had her do the same thing. As you see, the second line of numbers, it's much clearer. There's not as much, you know, shaky um, pens. Uh, I'm sorry, the marks, you know, little shaky marks that she has. And it's a little bit more clearer to be able to um, read. Okay, so that is about handwriting. Next, we're gonna have adaptive equipment for eating. People with Parkinson's have a daily chore of eating. And the reason why I say a chore is because it takes a lot of control to hold a utensil with different types of food on it. Not to mention the tremors, holding a utensil and bringing it to your mouth without spilling it. So here are some adaptive equipment that you might see. A lot of these are kind of mainstream, really. So if you see here, you've got the lip plates. You have the universal handles. This handle goes around. If you go over here, that's what that is right there. It goes, it's a strap that goes around the hand and you put the uh, handle, what the utensil that you're using in there. So you have more of a gross action, um, action going on, okay? There are weighted forks and knives. If you look over here, they look like regular silverware that you would use. However, it's at a specific weight. They are very affordable. You can get a set of these, probably about $40, $50 on Amazon. I had one of my patients purchase these because he was so embarrassed by his tremors when he was in the assistive living, he didn't want to go into the dining room. So that's definitely going to affect him socializing as well. So he got a set of these, he went into the dining room and it really worked for him and he was able to socialize. Then you have, you have these spoons down here. See the spoons, you have the uh, Geno spoon, kind of same concept as that gyro glove. It definitely offsets that tremor. I've had some people order these and they've been very successful with it. Then you have here, you have a weighted adjusted we call this, it's like a Parkinson spoon. However, it doesn't seem to be too successful because the spoon here is very, very light. And it needs, I think it needs a little bit more research on that. And there's the lip plate we talked about. And then here is a pad that you put a plate on so it's non-skid. All right, so that is for eating. Next. We're gonna talk about cooking. Now, here are some examples of assistive technology for cooking. Perhaps some of you might have these currently in your kitchen. Over here, you have the electric can opener. I think it's over here, yep. Yeah. Can opener. You have vegetable peeler. You have a food processor, a blender. And in the middle of C right here, it's called an induction plate. Some of these people have them in their kitchens already. This is a great addition to the kitchen because it, it is cool to the touch, but you can also boil a pot of water on it. I like this because it takes the risk out of being in the oven for burns. And also if you forget to put it, if you forget to turn off the stove. Okay. Then you have a rocking knife right here. So you use a, gro a gross grasp and you're using it going in a downward rocking type motion. So that prevents someone from it slipping underneath and cutting, cutting your hand. Now over here, since we're talking about that, this is one of those cutting gloves. These are great. These are about $8, $8 to $10 on Amazon. And what it does is you put it on. So when you're cutting, it helps you manage the food a little bit better. It helps it get like some friction um, plastic on, the, on the, the gloves. And when you're cutting and if you slip, it's not gonna cut your hands. I really like that. I, any of my patients that I feel that are tremoring, I definitely ask them to please get those. Okay. Then you have another thing and down on the bottom here, see this cutting board? It's called a Swedish cutting board. There's many different, um, versions of this too on the internet, but this is the original Swedish cutting board. It has a vise right here that holds food while you can cut it. it has prongs. You can set the, like a tomato or a softer type of vegetable or food and you can cut it. And then there's a corner over here that you can put the, um, 
the toast in and be able to toast it so it doesn't slide off. At the same time, it has non-skid. It's got the non-skid uh, cups down on the bottom, so it's not gonna it's not gonna slide off. Okay. Now, that's a lot. <laughs> there are so much more. I know these things might be really kind of simple, but it just jogs your memory. Like, yeah, that's right. I might have something like that, or just the simple thing of a cutting glove. It, it makes all the difference in the world. So now we're going to get to adaptive equipment for showering. Okay, there is a lot on the market here. And I had to kind of like go through which ones I really wanted, which ones I thought that you could really benefit from. So you have the long handled sponges. I think a lot of people know those and you can actually bend them. So you can reach on uh, uh, your back and also it's nice and long so you can reach your feet. Then you have tub mats. That's a nice friction um, for the make the surface on the bottom of the tub or shower a little bit um, safer. Then we have different types of tub benches. And then detachable shower head. That's really, really a number one thing a lot of my patients have. And why is that? Because you can detach it you can reach different areas if you can't reach it with the sponge. I'm gonna talk about another one of these in another, uh, in another uh, slide as we go. Then you have grab bars. Grab bars are another number one thing for people for safety in, in the bathroom. And I'll show you different types of grab bars later in the presentation. Then we have this portable shower. I thought this was the best thing. A portable shower that you can sit in anywhere in your house if it's got four by four, and you'll be able to attach it to a sink. And then you got a hose there and you can take a shower. And then what it does, that hose either goes outside a window, outside the door so that the water runs out. I thought this is a great alternative. Now here's some continuations of adaptive equipment. See how we different, different shower chairs, ones with handles, ones that are attached to the wall. This one goes in and out of the bathtub. And then this one's just sitting in the shower and it's up against the wall. Those are great, great options. There's a lot more on the market. Here are some continuation of adaptive equipment. In the shower, now, we have a shower mitt right here, which is basically a washcloth that someone's folded and sewed it together. You put the soap in it and you wrap it around your hand. And so you don't drop the silvery soap. So I thought this was great. It's very low key, it's very low costing, and you can even probably make one yourself. Another thing we have here is the shower socks. A lot of people are like, I didn't know there were shower socks. These are shower socks that have a non-skid sole on the bottom of them. You can take them and then wash them out and then put your feet back in. These are great um, addition to just wearing regular socks in the shower. And then you have another one here over here. This is the shower head. This I thought was fantastic. The shower head has a temperature reading, shows you what the temperature is, and then it has a color cueing grid of when it's hot. So you got cold for uh, green and then when it's red, it's hot. And some of them will shut off if it's too hot. Um, you can probably, some of them you can actually set. There are so many different ones on the market, but this one I thought was great because not only is it telling you the number, but you're actually seeing the color. So this is adapt equipment for hygiene and grooming. And as you see here in the pictures that I have, we have electric razors, electric powered toothbrushes. You have uh, blow dryer attachments, which I thought was, this was good. Because what happens a lot of people, if they want to use their hands, they can use their hands. They can either attach it to a counter or they can just sit it on top of the counter and they can have both hands to be able to do their hair. Then you have long handled combs and brushes. And then these are really new within the past couple of years. You get the hair dryer that has the built-in brush. It really um, saves, it does two things. It dries and curls at the same time. 
Next, we have adaptive technology for dressing. Now, when people go to occupational therapists, these are very common things that they show their patients. They're very similar, okay? So you have the button hook. This is great because what you can do is you put that um, hook thing in between the eyelet and then grab that button and pull it through. And you can do this one-handed, which is good. Then you have the long-handled shoehorns, helps you be able to put the heel back on your shoe. Then you have magnetic closures as far as uh, shirts and pants, jackets, and then jewelry. We've seen that out in the, in the, um, the market too. Then we have elastic shoelaces. Great, you can just put the elastic shoelaces and slip your feet in. And another side note on this is that now they're making more and more clothing adaptable. Zappos is a great website for adaptive equipment, um, adaptive clothing, especially. And the one thing I like now that Nike is actually doing, they're making a shoe that has a collapsible heel. And once your foot goes in, the heel comes back up and it doesn't come off your foot. So um, those run probably around 80 to $100, um, but it's a, it's a good alternative. Plus it's fashionable. Okay, so now this is one of my favorites. This is the adaptive equipment for around the home, okay? And the reason why I say that is because some of the stuff we've probably seen before. Now, here's an environmental control. The first one I remember was the clapper. Love the clapper. It's been around since 1984. And if you look at the newest versions of it, you have a series of claps. You can have one clap, two claps, three claps, and you can put three or four items on the clapper. Another one they have is new is called the Alexa. And you can actually do your a video doorbell. You can do your lights. You can do music. Um, and, and be able to lock your doors as well. Those are great environmental control systems as well as the lighting. All right, so here we go. What's going on here? All right, let's see what else we have on this page. We have the pill organizer. There are so many different pill organizers on the market. There's ones that auditory, let you know, hey, it's time to take. There's ones that it's like a big one and you put all your medications and it dispenses it for you. Um, they also have ones for uh, day and uh, in the morning, the noon and afternoon. Um, there's also uh, programs on the phone that also remind you to take your medications and also medically refills it for you. All right, let's see what we got here. And um, then right here, I love it. It's the lights, the motion sensored lights, especially for at the foot of the bed or in the hallway. So if at night, if you need to go to the bathroom, you have um, light that comes right on, but it's not gonna disturb your sleep. And this is a great safety issue and it's very affordable to do. Then you have this lever over here. It's a lever that you put on an existing doorknob and you just put it down so it actually turns it for you. For those people that have a hard time grabbing and doing that rotation, which is kind of sometimes difficult to do, you can just push it down. Okay, next slide, I believe. Here we go. Okay, soft surfaces for assistive technology. And why do I say soft surfaces? Because a lot of my patients complain about, I can't get off the sofa. It's too deep, it's too soft. So I'm gonna show you two things that might be a great option for you. The first one we have is the standing. It's an assistance handrail. You slide underneath the cushions, you have the handrails, hand rails, so it, you're able to push up from a harder surface there. Then you have furniture risers, very common. You just kind of bring up Bring up the sofa. So that kind of gives you a little bit of advantage of getting off of it. All right. Now this is adaptive technology for mobility. Now, what you have here is we have all different kinds of walkers. A lot of people see the walkers, they're standard walkers, they're more accessible, they cost less. They're, um, they might be a little bit less stable, 
but they're portable. Really the first option that people have. Then you have the rollators that are the kind of um, thing that we see out there now. The first rollator that we talk about with our patients is this U-step walker. It's designed to provide a greater stability and maneuverability and control. Squeeze one or two brakes and it, um, and it goes, whoops, sorry. And it goes, oh, sorry. <laughs> it has a um, definitely a, um, a laser thing that helps you um, be able to know where you're stepping. It's a cue and it's also got a clicking option. Also has a basket underneath offers a wide uh, ride base of support, and it's got that U shape. And the wheels you can fix at a certain traction level, so you can't go too fast and let it get away from you. Then you also have power wheelchairs. There's an ease of control, but you need to have a battery to charge. It's cumbersome, and sometimes you need a special vehicle to transport it. Another option, you have is scooters. Easier transportation, but it has a battery to charge. But it's easier to transport. You can get one of those little um, attachments on the back of your car and put it in. Ooh, we went too fast, sorry about that. Next, we have computers. Okay, there are two things on Microsoft that you can use as far as computer um, keys. One's a sticky key and one's a filter key. So the sticky key is if you're going to press and you need a combination like Alt, Control, Delete, what it does, it allows you to press one each individually. So you go into your settings and you can look for those type of programs. This is very, very important to some of my patients who don't have that coordination to do so. Then you have the filter keys. Filters keys is an accessible feature that you have on uh, the computer in the in Microsoft Windows program and instructs the keyboard to ignore the brief and repetitive keystrokes, kind of like when people have hand tremors. Then you have a typing aid. Whoop. You have the typing aid, which is you strap around your hand and it kind of like the universal grip that we had for eating. And it has a little bit of um, stem on the top of it. And what you do is you use that so they can type within a gross pattern. Mm -hmm. Next, we have the computer devices with options. There's large keyboards with contrast color. There are plastic covers for keyboards. So when someone needs to type, they have to actually put in force and effort. And that helps people, some of them that have just the light tremors, when they're doing like essential tremors, when they're actually moving their hands. This is a great option for them. Then there are different types of computer mouses, ones that are enlarged. And then you have this one down here, right here. This is from Germany. This is a mouse that works offsetting the tremors. It's new in development. And they said probably in a couple of years, it's gonna be a little bit more readily available for people. Then you have voice command softwares that shows you what um, you can actually use your voice to command what you want the computer or what to do. Kind of like we talked about before, that dragon, that text to the voice to text software. Now, this is adaptive technology for the car. Okay, there's extended car, the seat belts. See this extended seat belt? This is great for people who lack that rotation in their trunk. Many of my patients have ordered these. You have a swivel seat right here. So when you're getting in and out, it's helping you rotate your body to go in and out of the car. And another thing that we've seen in the past couple of years is this thing called the car cane. What you do is you put it, there's a latch here when you go to close the door, the metal latch, you put this hook thing in there and it serves as another surface to push on. It's better than actually taking and pulling yourself up from the car the car door, okay? And it's a little bit safer because it's not gonna move. This is a great option. And it's, it's, it's a good safety feature. I've seen it used many times. Now we have adaptive technology for personal safety. There's a lot of medical 
alert devices on the market. Some of them have the monthly fee. Some of them you can use, you can connect it to your cell phone, but it's very good to have and it's a safety feature. The next slide, I'm gonna go over some cell phone apps that might help you, okay? Then we have the Reacher. This Reacher is great. So if you have to go reach things down below or above your hips and your waist, that it's giving you the option to do so. Now I put over here, I put a whistle. Now I, whistle, I know it's not really so much adaptive technology, but since we're talking about personal safety, if a person has a hard time being to project their voice, the whistle is the next best thing and it takes le less effort to blow it than to yell for help. I learned this a while ago. I think it was my kids, um, Cub Scouts, but I thought is a great addition to your personal safety. Next, these are safety apps that I found on the computer. There are a lot of them. You can put them on um, your Android or Apple and most of them are free of charge. And a lot of them help you with your alerts as far as medications. And also some of these detect when there's not a lot of activity and they don't see a lot of activity on the phone or uh, in the house. And so they contact you. So you have one here, it's called MediSafe Medication Reminder. Then you have the ICE Medical Standard. It's like a medical alert bracelet on your smartphone. Locks, it has a lock screen displacement. That's great, very informing, and you can use a lot of different things on it. You have the noon light, silence calls for help or exact location at a tap of a button. Then you have the snug, oh, snug safety, made for people who live alone. These are great. Then you have the senior safety and the My SOS Family app. But I encourage you, if you really want to have a little bit more security and confidence, um, that they're alone safe, I would encourage you to get one of these applications and try them out. A lot of them have like a seven day free uh, trial period. Next, we're gonna go to home modifications. And I know some of you might be laughing about the three little pigs, but everybody has a different home. And that's what I kind of wanted to break up a little bit because there's so much information here. So without further ado, let's go into the home modifications. Well, in entrance and in entrance places, what I've seen most likely are the keyless entries. These are great. So say somebody's at home and they could not get up. This is a great option because it has a nice remote control. And if you also have a video, if you have like a video doorbell, you can see who's there and be able to open it up for them. Or you have a, a worker coming over, you have an aide coming over to help out. This is a great option. So you know who's at the door. Now we have rate, um, sorry, we have ramps and lifts for thresholds. There's also indoor and X door, uh, exterior type of ramps. Right here, you have the one that's outside the house. You have here, that's like a composite rubber, and then you have a metal one. And then you have these two happy ladies going up their stair lifts. Ones that go straight up and then those ones that go around. So you can do them inside, you can actually, put them inside and outside. Now this one shows a stair lift that's outside, almost like an elevator. So it comes down to the bottom, you go in, hit the button, go up and you're on that floor. These are more of an expensive option. Then you have the elevators. I thought that was kind of neat. I was a, there's a show place, a show um, room in Hartford called, I believe it's Life, Life, life mobility. And what it does, it has a lot of uh, adaptive equipment you can actually go and try. And so I went and tried a couple of these. I thought they were pretty neat. Now for adaptive, I'm sorry, for modifications in the bedroom, you have adjustable beds. They're a lot more affordable than they were years ago. And they help a lot as far as keeping the head of the bed up. And also it gives you a little boost to get up when you need to get out of bed. Then you have a transfer pole. This is a very popular product, product that I didn't know about. And what it does is it's a spring loaded, kind of like a shower curtain rod, but it goes from the ceiling down to the floor. 
and it has a little handle on it so it helps you get out of certain situations so say if you need to get in and out of the bed that was more of a um a struggle for you you can put it near the bed you can also put it in the bathroom we've seen and then you can sit put it in the living room then you have a bed rail this bed rail right up here this is a great product and what you do is you slide that bracket right underneath the mattress and it has the handle so it's easier for people to go from supine to sit which means laying down to sit or sit to stand here we go, here's the bathroom. There's a lot of toilet adaptations, which I kind of chuckle about because we all do need to go sometimes. <laughs> so if you look over here, in this picture right here, this is a mechanical toilet lift. It actually automatically lifts your buttocks off the toilet so it's an easier transition. I don't see a lot of these. Um, I've never had any of my patients try these, but if anybody has any knowledge of them, please, please contact me. I wanna see one in, in person. Now over here, we have an elevated toilet seat. See how the elevated toilet seat's got a little cutout? This is great. However, with this, it's plastic and then urine does get in it, so it gets to be unsanitary. Another option, but it's a little bit more expensive, is this toilet riser. It goes in between the toilet and the floor. You're going to need a plumber to lift up the toilet and put this underneath, but it's a very nice cosmetically pleasing alternative. Then you have these toilet frames. You have different ones, ones that look like a commode and ones that are attached to the toilet. Then this next one, we talk about handrails and grab bars. You have a toilet, I'm sorry, a toilet rail, which goes right near the side of the toilet, but it's more stationary, so that can be more cumbersome. They have ones that actually go out from the wall, like this lady is holding right here. It goes, you can fold it up and bring it back down. Then you have ones that have different levels of holding. I do like this one because it's more anatomically helping when you go to stand up. However, um, you really want to be more you want to put pressure down rather than pulling yourself up. Then you have this very standard grab bar right over here. These are great. Um, they do have ones with suction cups, but I do not recommend having the ones with the suction cups because if it does get loose, what's going to happen, it's going to be, it's going to cause a fall and it's going to be um, a trip to the emergency room. So try not to get those, try to get the ones that you can easily install. Now we have home modifications for bathrooms. This is really exciting because there's so many different options out there than there was like 20 years ago. So you have this first one right here and it's a cutout tub. What they did is they took the existing tub and they cut out this little part right here. And then, um, so it's easier so you can actually walk in or just have a little step to get in. However, if you wanted to have somebody else in the house that could want to take a bath, you just put the plug right back in. So it's very versatile. Then you have down here, these are two samples of wet rooms. And what do I mean by wet room is that everything is encased in either tile or a shower type of composite. Um, and it has a little um, ramp or a pitch in the floor. So the water goes down in a drain and it's, easy, it's more accessible. It will have a lot more like grab bars, detachable shower heads with, with rods, vertical rod for, uh, rod for it. So this is a really good alternative as well. Now I'm going to show you a couple of samples after of what a, a, a vendor did as far as home modifications in the next few slides. Before we do that, I want to talk about this accessible tub. This is usually for people who are in wheelchairs, but there are people that go and sit in um, and put the tub. These are one of those fill-up tubs. However, um, they need to put more features in it as far as um, a heater in it. Not that you have hot water, but by the time it fills up, it gets cold. Plus, if you have somebody that's very lightweight, it, they can kind of either slip. So you have to make sure that there are um, straps in there so they don't slip, almost like a seatbelt. 
Now, here we go. Here's a before and after. These are one of these things. These are the things I get excited about. All right. So they went to this person's house and they said, okay, we need to do something. We need to be able to get in and out of the shower, really having a hard time doing it. So if you see how they kind of, you kind of mucked up here and they said, okay, we're going to give you, a, you have a detachable shower head, but we need to put a little bar in here. Right. And then they wanted a cutout tub. However, when they got the, the quote back, they said it's best just to put in a walk-in shower with a flexible lip. If you look down here, there's a little lip down there. That flip that is a little flexible lip that when you step on it, it flattens down, but it also keeps the water from getting out on the floor. They also added more grab bars. If you look over here. And I think that's what I think that's what we did with that. Yeah, that's what they did with that. Okay. So instead of getting the cutout tub, they decided to get the walk-in shower. Okay, let's go ahead. And I'm gonna do another one. Okay, so this is another before and after in the bathroom. Now, what they did with this one is they wanted a walk-in, they wanted a walk-in shower. Um, this is on a second floor. So what they chose to give it more space in here, they gave them the same thing. It was the walk-in, it was the walk-in shower with the reflexible uh, lip there you got. They added more sidebars. And then what they did with the detachable shower head is they put a vertical rod so it could slide up and down. Now with this one, this renovation was about $8,400. It can get quite expensive. However, there are funding out there that can help people um, be able to uh, live in space and be able to make these modifications. Now this is a, this is a kitchen. Now this is a remodel of a kitchen. This is the before and this is after. And what they did is they put more lighting. They got more lighting in here because it's kind of dark right? They did some, over here, you got the gray paint. They put in some more lighter tile. They put a different stove, which is a little more on the, on the, on the countertop. Then they extended the cabinets up here to give it more storage. Then there was more counter space. They moved this. They moved the refrigerator too. I think they put it about over here. Then they put more accessible appliances in, which means that they did a lot of under the um, the counter type of appliances to give them more space. Now, these are some of the appliances they use in that kitchen. They had uh, a drawer where you put the dishes in rather than reaching up over the counter. And then you have underneath the counter dishwasher. And then you have under the, the counter refrigerator. These seem to be more popular now um, with the, a lot of the kitchen remodels. Here is universal design, okay? The universal design, um, it is, uh, it's more accessible, like we said, to different um, age groups and stuff. There's different principles that we go by on here. So if it was at home, you don't need to go with the American Disabilities Act. You don't have to um, do all the measurements to it, but if it's in more of a public place, you do. So these are some uh, home renovations they did. This is a wet room. You have the bathtub here and you have the showers here. Then you have this one as well. Now this one's a, a sample of a kitchen. See how wide it is? Not all kitchens are like this. This is kind of like the, the posh of the kitchens. So if you want to um, have any type of these remodeling, what you need to do is make sure when you're talking to a vendor, that they have done uh, renovations like this before. Also, if you're going to um, hire a contractor, just make sure you have people lined up, many different ones, many different quotes. Okay, so this is just the overview of what I did in my presentation as far as the entrance. We talked about ramps, grab bars, the keyless pad at the entries, uh, video doorbells, adaptive door handles, grab bars, toilet seats, risers, the showers, utensils, the cutting board, around the house, motion sensored lights, and the environmental control.
and safety apps. Here are the more complex ones we talked about, which also take a lot more money. You have the, um, you can put in new doors, stair lifts, permanent ramps, elevators, different kinds of grab bars, wet rooms, you have a tub, a cutout tub, you have the walk-in tubs, over the tub options are very popular. However, to put grab bars onto them, um, they don't have that, uh, stabilizing wood behind them to put it on. So you have to make sure they have that option. More accessible um, kitchen appliances or at the waist level, there's more lighting. And then we talked about a little bit more space in there. Now this is a funding, this is the, uh, the funding page. Now I know there's a lot on here. However, there's a lot of funding out there that can help people. So you have federal, usually federal and state funding. So the federal funding, you got the Medicare, in the Veterans Administration. The state level, you have the Medicaid, you have the expansion with Affordable Care Act, you have waiver programs, you have Money Follows the Person programs, you have assist assistive technology programs statewide that help with certain types of assistive technology, you have personal funds, then you have insurance. There's some long-term and personal care insurance that can help out with uh, affording some of these. Then you have grants, then try your local support associations. Then you have the Center of Independent Living, Federal Housing Administration, Rebuild Together, and the National Resource on Supportive Housing and Home Modifications. I know that's a lot, but I did put a lot of the websites to these in my resource page at the end. So, Living in place is becoming more and more common, whether with a low tech device or a full kitchen remodel, the options are readily available and can be custom to fit the needs of people with Parkinson's and their families. I only hope that this has inspired you um, with different options for you and your family. Thank you. I really appreciate being um, asked to present this information. And if you have any questions, I guess we're going to be going into that section. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rhonda. Thanks for sharing so many practical tips um, with our Parkinson's community. A lot of new things for me, new information that I, I'm really excited to share. Um, if you all have any additional questions for Rhonda, please continue to type them into the chat box on your screens. Amanda Brill, our board secretary of our APDA Connecticut chapter, is our Q&A moderator again today. Amanda, what questions did you get for Rhonda? I know we're going a little bit over the um, time, but we probably will allow for that today and um, ask some of the questions that came in because this is a really important and helpful discussion. Um, so Suzanne sent in a question saying, is there a device to aid in putting on coats, shirts, anything with sleeves? My partner is very limited due to shoulder stiffness. Well, what I would do first is contact your doctor and ask for an occupational therapist because there are many different ways to put on your clothes. And I have a lot of people who want to go put them down off the shoulders. That's very difficult to do. So we teach them different ways. There's many different ways to dress. So what I would do is contact somebody instead of getting a device, learn a, another way to do it. Okay. Thank you. Um, are stair lifts from Bob, are stair lifts safe for Parkinson's disease, considering issues like freezing, gait and balance problems? My husband is worried he may be unsteady at the top of the stairs, either getting into or out of the chair and end up falling down the stairs, 18 steps, sustaining worse trauma. Okay. So I think it's about getting in and out of the stair, stair lift. That's a valid question. Okay, so these stair lifts do have seat belts. And what they do is when they're at the top of the stairs, they go a little bit, some of them can go a little bit farther away from the stairs. So it prevents that from happening. And some of the stair lifts, you can probably put like um, a gate down. 
so that it prevents somebody from going down to the stairs. Okay. Do people use walkers or canes at the top and the bottom when they're lifting off from the stair lifts? Do they have yes. to use a device to help them? Yeah. Yep. Sometimes they do. They do. Um, these things are pretty sturdy. You can go on either side of the uh, stair staircase too, depending on how the stairs are and they can work with you. The vendors that do put these in are very equipped with um, the questions and how to put them in. And if you have any questions, they'd be happy to answer them for you. All right. Just a few more. Um, where, so I know that you went over the funding options. Yeah. One question came in um, about, are they, are there tax deductions as well? If it's medically needed from your, from your knowledge? I believe that they are, but they have to hit a certain uh, requirement. So whatever you're looking like, if you're looking in for like um, uh, Medicare and stuff like that, you want to see what it falls underneath. There are resources at the end of my presentation um, that you guys can definitely give out. Um, there's definitely many different websites. If you can't have access to the websites, um, either you can try to find somebody who can, or the library can definitely have those uh, that information for you. Um, a lot of it's you got to look at. You got to look very in the fine print and and to make sure that it's covered. Once you hit all those things that are covered, it's usually an easier process to go through. Okay. Um, and then on your slides, you showed computer soft computer voice to text software Dragon, but you didn't talk about it. I guess they were mentioning. Um, they want you to talk about Dragon. <laughs> okay. Dragon is the software that you put on your computer. And what it does is when you talk into it, actually prints or does the, the, uh, the writing for you. And so what it happens, it gives you the option. So if you can't use the keyboard, that you can use at least your voice. And it will detect the patterns in voice and your inflictions and stuff. So when you're writing, it's going to notice your voice and it's going to write for you. Great. And I think that they have a lot of that with cell phones too. These Absolutely. <laughs> um, so there's probably more out there than we really know. Absolutely. Um, so I would definitely encourage looking into Microsoft or looking into the settings of these computers. They are being more and more accessible to a lot of these things, to a lot of um, tremors, a lot of repetitive strokes on the keyboards and stuff. I think that is all the questions that we got sent in. I just wanted to reiterate that these, um, they're, I just, well, Jean, so Jean wanted to know if there's an actual demo of how writing pens work, an actual person using a writing aid, like seeing it I guess a video on the computer or any site. Absolutely. If you can on YouTube, YouTube usually has a lot of things. And I would assume, I would assume that they do have one. Okay. Um, because a lot of, um, which writing ones are you are asking about? She just wrote writing aids, um, the writing pens. Yeah, so. the writing pens. Yeah, there's so many different ones out there. There's ones with weighted. There's ones with large barrel pens. The best thing to do is get in contact with the occupational therapist. They should have quite a, a variety. I have a variety of, of pens along with heavy pens, big barrel pens, large pens for people to try to see which one better fits them. So speak to your doctor and get an order Absolutely. or a referral to see an occupational therapist. Yep. Um, and preferably somebody, some occupational therapist that has experience in working with Parkinson's. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you for your time today. I'm going to, I think, send it back to Rachel um, to close us up.
Yes, thank you again, Rhonda. Um, we're midway through our week-long symposium, and we have two more fantastic speakers scheduled for tomorrow and Friday. Please join us again tomorrow at 2 p.m. when Dr. Sule Tanaz, Assistant Professor and Movement Disorders Neurologist at Yale New Haven Hospital, will talk with us about the use of brain imaging in Parkinson's disease research. See you tomorrow.